Dear Lord, come by here. Speak to us, loving Savior. May you bless us in your presence as we present ourselves. May your Holy Spirit come and take control of us. God, please even take control of me that I may say that which is right in this hour. Bless us throughout. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beloved, my sermon title is Lord, teach us how to die. In the book of Luke, chapter 11, reading from verses 2, the Bible makes it clear that the disciples come to Jesus. And the disciples coming to Jesus request Jesus that Lord, teach us how to pray. But speaking from that phrase over there, I am convinced that the Lord has to teach us how to die. Beloved, you will die. Whether you like it or not, if Jesus doesn't come soon, you are going to die. Since the day Eve took that succulent bite on the fruit, death became the lot of humanity. And since that day to this day, beloved, unless Jesus comes to take us from this world, you will die. I know you feel like, but preacher, give us some encouragement. How I wish I would encourage you, but all the evidences around me convince me that death is a serious thing. And if you don't know how to die, beloved, it's going to be bad for you. You must know how to die. Too many people teach us how to live. One person must tell us how to die. 
Because if, if we don't know how we want to die, we will not even know how we should live. Beloved, the tragedy is not that we die. The tragedy is we die without living. Allow me to put it this way, as one of my favorite preachers would ask, are you afraid of death? Answer me, that's not a rhetoric question. Okay, let me make it rhetoric. Think. Are you afraid of death? Remember, your answer, whether it is yes or no, you should have a reason. Because if you tell me yes, I must ask you, why are you afraid of death? And if you say no, you must convince me why you are not afraid of death. But beloved, 90% of the people looking at me and within the radius of my voice are afraid of death. And I know you can confidently walk with the text that was our key text in Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verses 14, as you continue, that for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise took part of the same, that he might, through his death, destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Beloved, we fear death. And that's why God must teach us how to die. And when you look at this text, beloved, I am, I am convinced that if we don't know how to die, if we don't know how to die, it's going to be a tragedy for us. Beloved, I know there is a text somewhere in the book of Revelation chapter 14, reading from verses 12, that here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. But verses 13 of Revelation 14 says, And I heard a voice from the heaven saying, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now henceforth. That blessed are those who die in the Lord from now henceforth. And it says, Yes, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. And so we must come to the Lord once again. We must ask the Lord to teach us how to die. Beloved, death is a great equalizer. I have seen death. Take a toll on the young and the old. Death does not discriminate. In fact, death is not tribalistic. Luos will die, Kisses will die, Kikuyus will die, Negroes die, Caucasians die. Your skin color does not make death to respect you. Death comes upon everyone. Even your age is not a security. In fact, if you look at it carefully, you must be convinced that the way things are happening in Kenya, that text found in the book of Psalms chapter 91, which says that the days of our years are three score and ten. Seventy years. But look at Kenya. Allow me to ask a simple question. With all due respect to senior citizens, how many people in the congregation are 70 years and above? Take a census. I don't want to say that members of this congregation who are 70 and above, there is one representation, the Lord bless you. We are represented in the entire congregation by one person above 70. So beloved, before you rush to the book of Psalms, remember in this church, the only person who reached 70 is one. <laughs> So be careful, beloved. That alone is enough to sober you up. Before you start living the way you want to live, know that in this church, the records in this church shows that less than 99.999% don't reach 70. That is the record as we are talking today. So it means between today, the moment I am speaking, and the moment you will die, you must learn how you want to die. Or else you will be shocked by death. Beloved, but let me tell you, when I was in high school, I read those books that were called set books. I don't know what they were setting. But in those set books, one of the things that I read in the set books was one writer who said, a man who avoids death and gets killed in the end has wasted his care. Beloved, you can't spend your time avoiding death only to die. And that's why I say, and I want you to think of this, beloved, 
every time you're going to take a compromise on the word of God, every time you're going to do a stupid thing because you fear death, think again. When you're going to disobey God because you fear death, you know there are some people who will not come to church because my employer wants me to go to work. So let me ask you, and, and then you, you, you use very nice, very nice analogies. But now, preacher, if I don't work, how will I feed? Because if I don't eat, I will die. So now, now that you've decided to work on the Sabbath, are you going to live forever? <laughs> Beloved, if, if, if disobeying God, if disobeying God, you, you disobeyed God because you feared that you're going to be killed, does it mean now that you've disobeyed God, now you're living forever? No. That's why I am convinced that God must teach us how to die. Because some of us don't know how to die. Beloved, you've seen young men. Ambassadors, listen to me. You are young. And, and I love ambassadors. I love ambassadors. I love them because they are young. They are energetic. They can be able to decide how long they want to live. You know, as... as <laughs> You enjoy your birthdays when you're younger. But ambassadors, you can decide how long you want to live. If you decide to eat unhealthy foods right now, death by installment. <laughs> you are dying slowly by slowly. You are killing yourself step by step, progressively dying. And that's why all of us, and let me tell you something, as Christians, we must choose even how you want to die. Please, die in such a way that even when the pastor comes to preach on your funeral, the sermon is easy. We praise God on your funeral. We don't come to cry. Beloved, there are some people when they die, we have to tell you, please cry. Weep. This is the last time for this guy. But you know, there are some people when they die, we come and comfort people. You tell them, Relax, God is in control. Yet a little while, and they that should die in the Lord will die, and we shall meet in the street by and by. There are some people you cannot, even if you are a preacher, unless you are bordering on lying to the congregation. You know, there are some people you make it difficult for pastors. You are busy, you want to die a robber. You want to die as a thug. I'm a robber. You are stealing, and then you are shot dead. Now the pastor has to come and preach. And you know the pastor is trying to be sensitive to the people who are mourning. But the pastor also has to encourage people without lying. So the pastor has to come. Beloved, I am insisting that the Lord must teach us how to die. So that even those who are coming to preach in our funerals, it's easy. You know it becomes difficult. When at the funeral we come and some people are crying and they are saying we will miss you and everyone is wondering what are we missing. <laughs> it's tough. But beloved, why I say we must be taught how to die is because some people die in the wrong way. Some people don't die intelligently. I, I know you are wondering, but beloved, I was energizing. You've seen I've not read any text. I was energizing. Now we begin preaching. Turn with me to the book of Second Samuel. The chapter is the third chapter. No, no, no. Chapter three. When you see me in chapter three, no, we are about to finish. Let's go to First Samuel, chapter twenty-six. Now, in First Samuel, chapter twenty-six, under the sermon title, Lord teach us how to die. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 26, there's a story of a gentleman, very little spoken about, but one gentleman, I look at his life, and I say, Lord, teach us. His name was spelled by three, not three, but five letters. His father's name was spelled by three letters. His father was called N-E-R, Ner, and he was called Abner. The Bible says, and you know the story of the time when, 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 David, when David was being chased by Saul and David ran away. Then there's one time when Saul went to attack David and as Saul went to attack David, the commander-in-chief of Saul's army was called Abner, the son of Ner. 
Beloved, Abner the son of Ner was a valiant soldier. Abner the son of Ner was one man whom when you look at his CV, he was a very serious man. He was already coronated and given all the things that can be given to mighty men of war. And here was Abner, the son of Ner. As you read, the Bible says in the book of Dan- First Samuel, sorry, chapter 26, and reading from verses 5, And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about So Saul is the king, and Saul lies here in the trench, and then the rest of the army are around him. So for you to get to where Saul is, you have to delicately jump over all the soldiers, inclusive of the commander-in-chief. Beloved, that's protection. But this is not where I'm preaching from. This is where I'm starting from, and listen to how it puts it, that, that, that David came, and when David came with Abishai, they came there with Abishai, and, and as David comes there with Abishai, they, then Abishai says, the Lord has delivered Saul into your hand, just let me take that spear, I will kill him with just one thrust, not twice, I'm going to kill him at once. Ah, uh, David says, no, 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 do not touch the Lord's anointed. You didn't say amen because you like harassing preachers. Let me tell you, don't touch the Lord's anointed means. Beloved, you must learn to have respect for those who are ordained to serve you by the Lord. You must learn to respect pastors. You must learn to respect elders. You must learn to respect the Lord's anointed. And here David comes, has an opportunity. I know there are some of us, but this is not the church. Maybe it is. But don't prove me right. But there are some in some churches. Even before I finish preaching, they've started discussing me. It becomes tough. But, but, but you must learn that there is something about the Lord's anointed. And, and the Bible says that David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster. And they got him and no man saw it and ne- or nor knew it, neither awake. For they were all asleep. Because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Now you understand. The Lord had made them asleep. And beloved, when God gives you sleep, He can give it. God did make them asleep to the extent that people are jumping over their bodies and they can't wake up. You know, there are some of us, we have insomnia. You rarely sleep at night. You are troubled. Please, spend some time with God. I, I had my wife advise me some time back that if you have a problem sleeping at night, you just have a problem. This is not part of the summer. I'm advising you. If you have a problem sleeping, when you wake up, start reading the Bible. The devil has two options. Allow you to sleep or let you get closer to God. So anytime you find that something is troubling you, you can't sleep at night. Just open the Bible. Sing praises, do your devotion. Two days, three days, even the devil will be careful to interfere with your sleep. But, because, but, but anyway, the, the Lord can also give sleep, and he can give deep sleep. And the Bible says that David went over to the other side. And verse 14 of 1 Samuel 26 says, And David cried to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that cries to the king? And David said and answered, Art thou not a valiant man? And who is like unto thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy Lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king. This thing is not good that you have done. As the Lord liveth, you are worthy to die, because you have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see the king's spear and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And this was the beginning of trouble between Abner and David. Abner hated David because of the sharp rebuke that David gave him. But you see, David was right to rebuke Abner because Abner did not do his responsibility. Beloved, the lesson is there for us. Please, take your responsibility seriously. Wherever you are called, be serious with your responsibilities. 
I have always read the text and I like clarifying that Seventh day Adventist know Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And you know it, isn't it? Remember? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Beloved, that text should not only be read as remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You must read the next part. Six days you shall work. This is not the church of sluggards and lazy people. Six days go and work. You, you, can't be, you can't be resting. Beloved, it's hypocrisy. Resting on the seventh day, having worked, not even for half a day. You must work. Work for six days so that when the Sabbath comes, you are entitled to rest. Please, those who are in school, read. We have been told that ambassadors are passing exams. Please, do not make that be a statement. Make it a present reality. Ambassadors pass exams. And, and I like saying that, you know, when you pass exams as ambassadors, you are testifying to the Lord. So that people can know that serving the Lord makes people pass exams. Do you know there are some people who will not come to church because ambassadors are failing? If your God is giving you an E, E, I'm not coming to that church. So please, six days, labor properly so that the Lord can give you an A and people will come to the Lord. Because they will see what you've done or what the Lord has done through you. The story of Abner takes an interesting twist when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, reading from verses 12. A time came, and, and now at this point in time, after the death of Saul, David is made the king in Hebron. And then Abner decides to go and take the son of Saul, called Ishbosheth, and he makes him the king over Israel. Now, the reason Abner did this was because Abner wanted to exact a revenge against David. But beloved, beloved, listen to this story. Abner at this point, and, and this, is in, uh, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 2, reading from verses 12. It says, Abner the son of Ner, and the servants of his Bosheth, the son of Saul, went out to my name, from my name to Gibeon. Joab the son of Zeruiah, the servants of David went out and they met together by the pool of Gibeon. They sat on one side of the pool and the other sat on the other side. Then Abner made a statement or a challenge to Joab. He told Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. He said, let young people come so that they can play. And uh, beloved, young men, Choose the kind of games you are playing. I need to advise you, choose the kind of games you are playing. You just don't play any game. You are a child of God. There are certain games you don't play. You don't play risky games with your life because you are a child of God. And these ones came to play. And the Bible says that they arose and went over the number of twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to his bushes. They caught everyone by the head, and they thrust a sword into his fellow side. They were fighting. They were killing each other. There was war that day. Verse 17 says that there was a very sore battle. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. Then listen to this part. There were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. So remember, Joab is the commander-in-chief of David's army. Abishai is the one who went with David, and they went and took that spear of Saul. And now there's another third brother called Asahel. And the Bible says that Asahel was as light of foot as a wild robe. That he was light-footed. That is, that is the biblical way of saying he was good when it came to running. He was light-footed. And the Bible says that Asael decided to chase Abner. So, picture in your mind, Asael is running after Abner. And Asael is very fast. But the Bible says that as he ran after Abner, Abner starts begging him that please turn from the left so that you don't follow me. Turn from the right so that you don't follow me. But he kept on following Abner. And as he followed Abner, the Bible says in verses 22, 
No, the Bible says in verse 23, I'll be it, he refused to turn aside. Wherefore, Abner with the hinder end of his spear smote him under the fifth rib that the spear came out from behind him and he fell down and died in the same place. Now that is serious. As I was preparing for this sermon, I had to consult with my doctor brother. And and I had to know what is the big thing about the fifth rib. And, and, And one thing that I learned is that the fifth rib, the point of the fifth rib, is the place where, if it's on the right side, is the place where you find the left ventricle of the heart. And if it's on this other side, is the place where, the place between the liver and the gallbladder. And Abner smote a sire under the fifth rib and the guy died on the spot. When he died, it brought another enmity. This enmity now comes between Joab and Abishai. They decided to now chase Abner. And they chased Abner the whole time for the constant of time. Allow me to jump all those verses. You will get your time to read them. And after that, they went and they got to a point and they stopped chasing. Second Samuel chapter is 3, reading from verse 6. In Second Samuel chapter 3, verse 6, remember it is Abner who set Ishbosheth to be king. It's Abner who set Ishbosheth to be king. And the reason he said he cautious to be king was because he wanted to retaliate. He wanted to revenge. In fact, allow me to read from Signs of the Time, and this is June 15, 1888. The messenger to the remnant makes a statement to these wise. The circumstances under which Abner was placed served to develop his real character. He revealed himself as a man who was controlled by ambition and principle at heart and only desirous of exaltation to a high position before men. Beloved, look at your life. Abner was one, we are told he was very ambitious. Number two, he did not have principle. Beloved, in your ambition, you must have principle. The problem with so many people, the reason corruption is so rampant in Kenya is because people are ambitious. But without principle. So somebody doesn't care if he's going to get rich and everyone else will suffer. They don't care. Ambition without principle was what controlled Abner. And Abner wanted a high position irrespective of how he will get to that place. Nowadays I see young people interested in uh, (laughs) exaltation. By the way, I hope nobody in this church does those things that young people do. You've seen the young people, the strange things they do on Sunday. I wish all young people would spend time in ambassador and youth. And please, ambassadors, leader and youth leader, ensure every Sunday there is a meeting. So that they come here, rather than going to the streets of Nairobi to take photos, which they even don't know what to do with. They take photos when they don't even know how to dress. Please, please, come to church. Learn how to sing. And I don't know where they get money to buy those cameras. Man, they have expensive cameras. Those cameras are expensive. I don't know where they get the money. But if at such a tender age, to you what matters is to be photographed. Now let me ask you, have you ever seen somebody who earns a living out of standing to be photographed? I mean, you know, photographers earn a living, but the person whose photo is being taken, does he earn a living? That you, you just stood over there. And let me tell you, be careful if you are earning a living out of studying so that your photo can be taken. And I know you're saying, <laughs> we are modeling. Beloved, I am not old. I am fairly young. But when I was younger than this, modeling was using plasticine and mud. 
Nowadays you stand, you think you are modeling. That is not modeling. Please go back to class. Do your art and craft so that you know what modeling is. You can't go around standing and exposing your skin. Beloved, let me tell you, and I'm convinced about this one. If, if you are not beautiful, you have to expose yourself. But if you are beautiful, you relax. In fact, those who are beautiful even know how to contain beauty. They know how to behave with it. But if you are not beautiful, you are scared. You know, there are some people, there are some people. I, I, I was telling a congregation the other day, there are some people, they were just about to get beautiful and they are disturbing us. Disturbing us everywhere. We don't have peace because they were about to be beautiful. What if you are beautiful? <laughs> Beloved, you must know how to live. And let me tell you, a life that is lived outside Christ, and that's why God looks at the heart. We don't, we don't spend so much time on the outside. Those who spend a lot of time on the outside have nothing in their heart. If you have something in the heart, it will take care of the outside. Beloved, he that made the heart, can he not fix the outside? Nowadays, there is even plastic surgery. But, but God starts with the heart. He fixes the heart. Once your heart is fixed, you are safe. So spend time at the feet of Jesus and look at Abner, desirous of exaltation. And for that reason, Abner saw that he could not gain a higher position through Ishbosheth. So Abner comes and makes a bargain with David and tells David that, David, I am coming. I want to give you the entire king, the entire Israel, the rest of Israel. Can we make a bargain? That is the part that we have in, uh, in chapter 3 from verses 6 up to 21. Abner comes and makes a bargain with David. And he comes and tells David that, David, I want to help you. And, and listen to this. In Signs of the Time, June 15, 1888, the messenger to the remnant says this word. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. For Abner was determined to gain his desire at any cost. Beloved, look at your ambitions. He was desirous to gain his desire at any cost. And in fact, the messenger to the remnant says, the question may be asked, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? And I like the way the messenger to the remnant says, that success in such a case is a terrible disaster. When you are successful in doing evil, that is disaster. You can't say that uh, I'm a successful prostitute. You are in trouble. That is not success. That is death. You can't be a successful thief. That you know I'm very intelligent. I steal and nobody notices. Beloved, choose how you brag. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a successful gossip. <laughs> I'm a successful liar. Beloved, choose. Choose the things for which you are ascribing your success. And the message of the remnant goes ahead to say, Far better is humility and loss of high-sounding titles than to run any risk of the loss of the soul. Better far the cross and the disappointment. Better far shattered hopes and the world's neglect than to sit with princes and forfeit heaven. Choose how to die. Because there are those who will die and rush to hell fast. And I like saying that please, as Seventh day Adventists, please choose how to die. I told the congregation the other day that for a Seventh day Adventist to be found in hell, it is tough. It is tough because when you are a Seventh day Adventist, imagine. With vegetarianism, with the right kind of lifestyle, it means you are given high quality fuel in, all, in hell. As in, when you are burning, your combustion rate is higher because even your quality is higher. So please, choose, choose wisely. You've avoided eating all the things that will make you useless and then you go to hell. Beloved, surely... Anyway, and, and, and listen to what the messenger to the remnant says. Abner had desired honor and he was determined to have it at any cost. 
He had desired honor, and that's why Abner now comes to make peace with David. And when he came, the Bible says in verse 21 of 2 Samuel chapter 3, that David sent Abner away and he went in peace. Listen to this part. And allow me to put this to a rest in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And thanks for your patience so far. It says in verses 22 of 2 Samuel chapter 3. Let me read all the text, then I explain and we end. It says, And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in the great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Abron, for he had sent him away and he was gone in peace. And when Joab and all the hosts that were with him came, they were told that, they told Joab, that Abner the son of Ner had come to the king and he had sent him away and he had gone in peace. Beloved, remember, Joab has some deep-rooted jealousy because of two things. One, another army commander is coming. <laughs> you, you've seen this handshake problem that Kenyans have. You, you've seen it. Now you think it's the first time Kenyans are having a problem with power sharing and such kinds of things. These things were already there. And everyone gets scared. You know, you know those people whom <laughs> you are in the choir, you are the, lead, you are the lead voice. Then some aspiring young gentleman comes and he also comes with another serious lead voice. The one that leads the leaders. You know, when you see that, some people, beloved, when you see somebody who can sing better than you come into the choir, please encourage them. Because they've helped you so that you are not burdened by all the times you look. Even your voice will be eroded. Please encourage them. But you see, the problem with jealousy is, jealousy even blinds us from reasoning. And that's why, when Abner saw another army commander coming and making peace with David, instead of seeing that the enemy has become part of us, he saw that this guy has come to take my position. When he was sent away in peace, he decided to pursue him. And, and listen to what happened when he decided to pursue him. Joab came to the king and said, what have you done? Behold... Abner came unto thee, why have you sent him away and is gone? You know Abner the son of Ner, that he came to deceive you, and to know you are going out and you are coming in, to know all that you do. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him from the well of Sirah, but David did not know it. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him under the fifth rib. And he died for the blood of Asael, his brother. But beloved, the painful part of this story is not that Abner also has died. But the painful part of this story is the statement that he said after Abner has died. And, and afterwards, when David heard about it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless of the blood of Abner before the Lord forever. Let his rest in the head, on the head of Joab and on all the house of his father. And let there not fall from the house of Joab, one that fails. This was a big cast. He says, let it not fail from the house of Joab, somebody who has an issue. That's a cast. Or someone who is a leper. Or someone who leans on the staff. <laughs> Beloved, if I was born in the house of Kina Joab, I would start repenting my sins. Because this guy is going to come and he says, So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain Asael, their brother. And listen, David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, Rend your clothes. In fact, David gave Joab a state funeral. Abner, sorry. He gave Abner a state funeral. And when you look at it, David commanded everyone, inclusive of Joab himself, that you are going to come. And David was the chief mourner during that funeral. And listen to the words. They buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner and all the people. Beloved, what do you normally say when people die? 
When you are given an opportunity to do eulogy, what do you normally say? Go in peace. There is nothing peaceful in death. But please, please beloved, if you want to tell me something, tell me right now. This issue of coming to make a lot of noise after I am dead, please don't do that. In fact, I keep on telling my wife, these are those sad stories you don't like sharing with your wife all the time. You may be thinking that you are a prophet of doom. But I, I keep on telling my wife that if I die, if I die, I don't want people to come at my funeral and start saying things about me. Please, when you come to my funeral the day when I die, come, let that time be given to the pastor to preach to people that they should go to heaven. Please, I have said it in public, you all now know my secret, but when I die, don't come, don't come to the funeral asking for one minute to tell people how you love me. Please, if you love me, tell me right now. But when I die, don't tell people you love me. Tell them that they need to go to heaven. Because there's nothing about telling them you love me. I'm dead. The living know that they will die. The dead know nothing. Beloved, it's almost as though we are questioning our theology on the state of the dead. In our eulogies. You should read what people write. Special dedication to dead ones. Speaking to the dead. Be careful. I know I'm scaring you. I wish I would scare you. But people are speaking to the dead. You go over there, oh loving mother, you've left us. When you are here with us, we will remember. Please, tell loving mother right now. When they are dead, please, don't write those things about loving mother. Whom are you addressing? No, I, I'm just asking a simple question. Whom are you addressing? Please, don't talk to loving mother. When loving mother is dead, Talk to loving mother right now when they are still alive. When they can hear you and they know that you love them. Even if they don't believe it, tell them. (laughs) You know that there are some people you tell them you love them, they look at you like they don't understand the anatomy of love. But relax. One time when you are gone, they will know that you love them. And and listen, listen to the eulogy as as David came and, and David is crying at the grave of Abner the Bible says in verses 33 of 2nd Samuel chapter 3 that David lamented over Abner and said dieth Abner as a fool dieth Lord teach us how to die we can die like fool dieth Abner as a fool dieth beloved let's not die like fools that is serious. You didn't say a man, but I'm reminding you. We can't die like fools. We have to die like wise people. We have to die like people who know that Jesus came to die for us so that we may know how to live for him. We can't just be here dying like fools. In fact, when you look there, the king did not stop at that. The king says, Dieth Abner as a fool dieth. Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put in fetters. Beloved, you didn't understand. Allow the preacher to explain. He said, you are not tied. You are not forced to die like a fool. You are given the opportunity to make the right choice. But you died like a fool. And so you see, we have so many young people. They are going into drinking themselves to death. Young people are getting into drunkenness. Your hands are not tied. You are not bound in chains. Ah, beloved, you've seen it every day. Nowadays, people die too many. People are killed too many until they, don't, they cannot make headlines anymore. You see a young girl, age 17, killed. Why? Sponsor. Now, beloved, 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 please spare us. Don't die like fools. You see a young boy, age 20 something, murdered. Why? They were fighting over a girlfriend in the university. I, I don't know about you, beloved, but your hands were not tied. That girlfriend is not even going to be your wife. Imagine. That's why that one is called girlfriend. A friend who is a girl, not wife. Please, if you want a wife, come. You saw what was done today, you will be praying for. But please, till death do us part is only in this one. The other one, that one is 
My friends, beloved, your hands were not tied. You make it difficult for us. You saw the other day, and it was in the news. They go, and I'm warning you about photography again. You saw them going and standing on stones so that they can take a photo that everyone will be happy about. Now, what are we seeing? Rivayala swept them away. The river does not understand that this photo is serious. <laughs> Beloved, choose how to die. Lord, teach us how to die. We can't die like fools. Your hands were not tied. There is nobody who pushed you to the edge of the stone. Stand here. Nobody pushed you. You make it difficult for us. And beloved, beloved, I am this serious because we are going to die. <laughs> it's true. We are going to die. You know, it's, it's written in the book of First Corinthians that <laughs> I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Beloved, but some of us have to die. But please don't die like a fool. When your hands are not tied, don't die like a fool. Please, for you not to die like a fool, choose to live like a wise person. Who is a fool? Let me end with that statement. Who is a fool? You know, you see somebody failing in the exams and you tell them you are a fool. That is not a fool. Failing in exams may actually mean that you wrote the right answers to the wrong question. <laughs> no, it's true. You answered the wrong question. That's why you failed the exam. You are not a fool because you failed the exam. You are a fool because of what I am going to tell you. There are people who failed the exams just because... <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Uh, I assume a question like this one. Uh, who is the president of Kenya? Then you are busy answering. Donald Trump is the president of the US. Now, beloved, your answer is correct, but it is the answer to the wrong question. We ask you the president of Kenya. So when you fail exams, beloved, please spend time at the feet of Jesus so that also you lie to align your answers to the questions. <laughs> there are some of us that are putting, you know so much, because, beloved, when you see somebody has spent two hours to write nothing on a piece of paper, that person is intelligent. But the, their intelligence is not aligned in the right direction. So spend time at the feet of Jesus. But let me tell you about a fool. And it's recorded in the book of Psalms chapter 14 and Psalms chapter 53. Listen to Psalms chapter 14 reading from verses 1. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. That's a fool. The person who says in their heart that there is no God. Beloved, you don't have to shout to everyone that there is no God. How you live your life tells us whether you believe that there is God. When you are living as though Jesus is not coming again tomorrow, you say in your heart that there is no God. You can profess, you can tell us what you want to say, but deep down in your heart, we know you are saying there is no God. That's why there is a parable of the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. Do you know who virgins are? You know, we are in the 21st century. Do you know who virgins are? This, this is a digression. This is not part of the sermon. This is a digression. You know, when I was young, and I am not old, when I was young, such questions were easy to ask in church. But I am going to ask it here. Then you will see. You will see young people looking at one another and looking down as though they don't know what I'm asking. But I'm asking, are there virgins in the congregation? <sighs> Allow me to take it a notch. Do I take it a notch? Do I take it? Oh, preacher. Preacher, please be sensitive. You know there are kids in the congregation. Kids must know how to be virgins. If they are not told that people should be virgins, before they even get to 10 years, they are no longer virgins. But ambassadors, this is your day. Don't hate on me. But let me, let me direct my question to you, because ambassadors should not be married. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. So ambassadors should be virgins. Yeah. Should I make this a rhetoric question, or I just ask it openly? Ask it openly. 
That preacher, be careful. Preacher, no. Preacher, we are not inviting you again if you are embarrassing people in church. Beloved, how can it be embarrassing? It's almost like saying, if I was to ask, how many thieves are in the congregation? Look at that. Look at that. that if you know you are not a thief, put up your hands. Before I even say, hands are going up. But when you ask, how many virgins are in the congregation? Preacher, please, relax. But beloved, let me tell you, it's because we are spending a lot of time with the wrong things. That's why right now in the 21st century, we have fewer virgins than when we were young. And there was silence in heaven for the space of about half an hour. (laughs) But beloved, my plea to you, my plea to you, let's live right. There is Abner as a fool diet. And in fact, beloved, let me put the sermon to that point and just close it. Because you know, a sermon does not have to be immortal, eternal for it to be immortal. We can end the sermon in good time when you've understood what you need to understand for the day. We don't have to stretch you beyond that. But let me tell you something. The Lord must teach us how to die. Look at the lives of these few people. Look at, what's his name, Paul. In 2 Timothy, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and, 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 and I just want to end with people who know how to die. And let me tell you, if you spend time at the feet of Jesus, you will look at death in the face and you will tell them, come on. Yeah. You will not be afraid of death. You will look at death and you will say, now. And, and listen to Paul say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 6, he says, for now. I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand, for I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we must fight the good fight. We must finish the course. We must keep the faith. Then we'll be ready to die. You can't be here, you have been called to fight, and you're just throwing punches in the air. So instead of, you know those people who are weak, instead of beating somebody, they are moving backwards. When you are young, when you are young, you will see them, they are threatening and they are telling, please, prevent me from hurting him, prevent me. So you keep on, you keep on shading him and he cannot even hurt anyone. Beloved, a child of God must fight the good part. You must look at the devil and say, and the devil can do me no harm. When you are in Sabbath school, you sing the songs. When you grow up to become an ambassador, you forget the songs. What's wrong with us? When I was young, we will sing, I'm a soldier in the army. Ah, did you sing? If I die, let me die in the army. If I die, let me die in the army. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. May God bless us. Beloved, look at another gentleman. Here is he in the book of Genesis chapter 50. And reading from verse 24, the Bible says, Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which you swear. And Joseph took an oath with the children of Israel and said, God will surely visit you and you shall carry my bones from hand. Beloved, you should know how to die. So that when you die, you can give the right instructions. Oh, you should look at this one in the book of Joshua. And that is Joshua chapter 23, reading from verses 14. And Joshua says, I go the way of all the earth. Let me finish with that one. As the last text. In Joshua chapter 23, Reading from verses 13, he says, No for a certain it is that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes, and ye shall perish from all of this good land which the Lord has given you. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed or all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all have come to pass. Beloved, the Lord has prepared a good place for you. But you must know how to die. 
Because if you die in the right way, you are going to a better place prepared for those who die in the Lord. And let me tell you, if you die in the wrong way, you are this set. You are going to hell. Choose this day how you will die. May God bless you. Amen. And may God see you through everything. Let's rise up for a closing word of prayer. Allow me to sing my song one more time. Let your living waters flow over my soul. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control of every situation that has troubled my mind. All my cares and burdens unto you I hold. somebody in the congregation within the radius of my voice. God is speaking to you and you've heard God say that please this day you should choose how you should die. And and you're looking at your life, you've not been living in the right way. And and, and when you look at your life, you get to die today, you'll count that you're dying as a fool. But having listened to God speak to you, you're saying, God I want to renew my walk with you. God, I want to start walking with you afresh. That if I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. If there's such a person, please come out and pray somewhere. Any pastor, I just want to pray somebody who wants to dedicate their life to Jesus in a special way. You're saying, I'm looking at my life. My life is not right with the Lord. But I say today, dear Lord, I have listened to you speak to me. And I want God, if I am to die, let me die in the Lord. Somebody wants to die in the Lord, and they're looking at their life and saying, God, I need to change something in my life. Thank you, my sister. Just come, I'll pray to someone. As I normally say in my appeals, I don't have the power to heal you. I don't have the power to forgive your sins. But I can pray to him who has the power to forgive you of all your sins. Come out, pray to someone. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Any person, just look at your life. Don't worry about the person next to you. Their appeal may come another day. But today you've listened to God and you're saying, God, I want to give my life to you. Just come. I want to pray with some. You may be the reason for which we've been delayed up to this point in time. For your sake. While the doors of grace, of mercy are still swinging on the hinges of grace, come, I want to pray with someone. Someone is saying, Lord, you can look at me. You can see my life. And God, please, make my life right with you. You can change me. You can mold me in the right way. I claim the hands of a porter. God, just help me out. And you're feeling the cry and the need in your heart. Just come on, pray with someone. Because there's still some soul coming. I'm still excited. But I'm about to be through. I'm about to be through. Please just make way. And if somebody's coming, don't hinder them. Make way for them to come to the Lord. So many people are dying without hope. So many people are dying without knowing the Lord. But today you're looking at your life, you're saying, God, 
I want to walk in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Just help me, dear Lord. Somebody, just come and pray. Before your holy presence, we present ourselves. God, forgive us of our trespasses and teach us to forgive those who trespass against us. When the disciples cry, Lord, teach us how to pray. Today, I join in the refrain and cry, Lord, teach us how to die. And above all, Lord, teach us how to live in this present world that we may be ready for your second coming. God, your children have presented themselves here. And God, looking at our lives, there are things we feel that are a hindrance to the gospel. But looking at you, there is nothing that kills us from salvation. And so we come and we present ourselves. God, may you transform us, may you bless us, may you take control of our lives. And God, guide us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. God, if there is something wrong that we've done, if there is something that we've not done that will bring glory unto your holy name, we pray for forgiveness. Above all and in every way, God, may you transform our lives and God, may our lives testify to others that we spend time at the feet of Jesus. Lord, teach us to live. The Bible says that a thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. You are come to give us life and give us life abundantly. God, teach us to live that abundant life now and forevermore is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you all and the Lord keep you all safe.